Well, good morning. Today is uh, March 11th, and we're on lesson, still part of, part three of, what's that? You said it's March 11th. Oh, May, it, no, it's June 11th, yeah. <laughs> June 11th, sorry about that. Wow. Yeah, there's one of those months, yeah. Uh, we're on lesson six in the series on meditation. This is the third part on how to meditate. And I, I think this class is probably going to run through the end of June, so maybe a couple, three more lessons left. Uh, so if you're saving up any, any questions, um, uh, be sure to get them in in time. So, all right, so let's start off with our, with our quiz. Uh, what are a few of the words used in Scripture describing meditation? What are some of the synonyms for meditation? Pondering, Pondering yeah. Ruminate. Ruminate, yeah. Mutter. Mutter. Mutter, yeah. You shout them out if you've got one. Study. Study, yeah. Yeah. Think, consider, yeah. How does the Bible describe the importance of our thoughts? What kind of significance is attached to that? It's a great, it's of great significance. Yeah, that's right. Uh, sometimes the significance is appreciated by its contrast. So, how is uh, how is a poor thought life depicted in the scriptures? Frivolous. What's that? Frivolous. Frivolous. Yeah, that's one way of having it. What else? Vain. What did you say, Henry? Vain. Vain thoughts could be vain. What's the other one? Futile. Futile. Yeah, futile and vain. Yeah, the Gentiles. The sum of their thoughts are. Depicted as, as being fruitless. What were the three elements of our working definitions of meditation? We had three different components to the working definition of meditation. Describe the three aspects of it. I'll give you a hint on the first one. It desc- the first part was describe the approach to meditation. It was a uh, serious, it was a deliberate endeavor to think about. And the second part was content. What was, what are the areas of content in meditation? Creation. Creation's one, yeah. Scripture. Scripture's the other. And there's a third. Providence. Providence is the third. Yeah, those are the three great spheres of content. The Bible, creation, and providence. And what was the final component of the definition of meditation? What's its aim or end? Stir up our hearts toward God. To stir up, uh, to affect the ha- hearts, to rouse the hearts, to settle the hearts. So it's a serious endeavor using scripture, creation, analysis of providence so that our hearts might be stirred up. Yeah. What are some of the steps we can perform to prepare for meditation? We had covered a bunch of these steps last week. Putting it in the schedule? Putting it in the schedule, thinking about it, planning it, yeah. What else? Have a plan. Have a plan, yeah. That's right. What else? Find some place without distractions. Yeah, yeah. find a place that, without distractions. Yeah. Anything else? Those are all good. Why are reading and studying not the same as meditation? Head knowledge isn't the same as heart knowledge. That's part of it, yeah, that's right. It doesn't have the same end in mind, does it? It's to affect and move the heart. And I was briskly corrected after <laughs> last week. <laughs> so when we think of words like ruminate, there was a discussion which... Your fearless leader led you astray, and let me emphasize that we regret the error. Apparently, cows have four stomachs, and who knew? I didn't, uh, but now I do. And so we regret the error, and we thank those who participated in the correction. <laughs> All right, so we're, uh, we're going to uh, attack uh, the t- topic of meditation in a slightly different way, we, we had a whole lesson devoted to what are the great cultural errors in 
uh, that surround us with ideas of meditating today. We had a whole lesson on it. And today I'd like to uh, attack another form of error that can creep in uh, that can be found in the church. So not necessarily things that they're doing in India, Nepal, or through a class or through an app, but things, uh, attitudes and approaches that we can run up against that can inhibit the practice of meditation. So we're going to start with this section in uh, the confession. And there's a phrase in here that I hope will uh, get lodged. And then we'll, we're going to take it apart and see some examples of why this thing is important here. Um, so this class you can think of as that second section in the practice of meditation. We have the reading and we have the study and then the meditating and pondering over here. But in the study section, uh, we, have a, we have a phrase called plain in themselves inside this particular uh, section of the confession. So I'm going to read that for us. All things in scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor like clear unto all. Yet those things which are necessary to be known believed and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of scripture or other that not only the learned but the unlearned in a due use of the ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. So let's talk about plain in themselves and clear unto all. Uh, the scriptures are full of, in, it's full of information that is easy enough to understand. <laughs> There's lots of things in the scripture that are not complicated. Um, what might be some examples of things that are just patently clear that anybody can understand by picking up the Bible and reading it? We're sinners. We're sinners. You, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't take an exhaustive, comprehensive look at the Bible to see man is depicted in a sinful way. That something's gone wrong. Yeah, what else? Man is a created being. Yeah, it doesn't. You don't have to. You don't have to know a lot about original languages or philosophy to understand that. Yeah. What else? What else might come to mind? We can be saved through Christ. Yeah, we can be saved through Christ. Yeah, that the idea that these things, uh, you can attain salvation through the ordinary use of means by things that are clear in the Scripture is presented in this section as being undeniably true. And I don't think it's a difficult proposition to see that. But there's something implied in this section that is, I think, underappreciated. And that is, not everything is plain, and not everything is clear. Some things require substantially more effort. And there's this idea that the ordinary means, you know, what, what might ordinary means mean what are they trying to tell us about ordinary means, the do use? What's, what's contained in that idea? Reading. What's that? Reading. Reading, okay, sure. So I was actually thinking about whether or not reading, for the unlearned, whether reading was included or not. Yeah, see, that's... At the time of the Reformation, that was one of the things they were they trying to accomplish. That's exactly right. Person. Yeah, literacy can't just be assumed. Uh, that's a very good point. Yeah. I mean, I think Henry's right today. Very, we have high literacy rates. We have, we have very high literacy rates compared to other times in the world. But the, the fact of the Christian religion being people of the book sort of implies that there's going to be a familiarity with words in the practice of reading. Sure. What else is included in the ordinary use, ordinary means? Preaching of the word. What's that? The preaching of the word. Sure, yeah, the preaching of the word, something that you can hear and understand. Yeah, what else? It's, don't look for complicated reasons. This should be plain in themselves, <laughs> what the ordinary means are. Is praying it? Uh, praying about things, absolutely, can be part of that. Um, but thinking about it, right? Uh, just finding, finding these passages of Scripture and thinking it, another underappreciated element is discussing it. Finding somebody to talk to about it, uh, having a conversation about different things. So it's, it's a point uh, that can be, that is, that is so obvious, yet because of its obviousness, maybe something you don't recognize as easily, that we are a created being with a mind that God gave so that we can tackle these things. And he made 
an abundance of the scriptures plain in themselves and clear that we can attain salvation. But that's not the end of the story. And that's not the end of the approach we have in reading the Bible. We don't approach the Bible. Now that we've got the salvation thing down, we coast. It doesn't stop there. It begins with those things. So we're going to, um, we're going to use a new word. Uh, I think it will probably be new for many of you guys to describe uh, the uh, to describe this approach, paranomasia. I love this word. It's paranomasia. It's a play upon words, a figure in which a word is repeated with a variation in the sense. Look at Matthew eight twenty two for instance. This is Jesus talking to a young man. He says, "Follow me, and leave the dead." to bury their own dead. Where's the play in that, in that f- verse? Follow and believe, both actions are going somewhere. Sure, but that's not really the play on the word. That's a, a word in which it's repeated with a variation in the oh, sense. Spiritually dead versus physically dead. Yeah, the, the play is in the dead versus the dead. Now, I, I gotta wonder, could Jesus have told this man what to do in simpler terms? Is it possible? Yes. Of course it is. Yeah. So why did he make it difficult? Why did he make it more difficult than it needed to be? What's the point? I mean, he did. He obviously did. And he obviously could have said it even simpler, right? There are simpler ways to describe that action that he wanted to do. Yeah. But he didn't do it that way. So they would think deeply about it. So that they would stop and think deeply about it. That's exactly right. And so... It's one thing to say the scriptures have plenty of things that are plain, which implies there are other things, many things, that are not so plain and things that take some time to work out. But when it comes to the design, you wouldn't necessarily be quick to believe that God said things in ways that make it harder to understand, that there are speed bumps, and some of those speed bumps are kind of high. So if you want to understand a lot about the scripture, you can't coast through on simplicity. It's something that, by definition and design, is going to require a fair amount of work. Uh, so paranomasia is, I think, a, it's an easy-to-understand example of something that could be done in a simpler way, but is not done in a simpler way. And this is just one example. I only picked it because it's an obscure word. But it's a simple verse and can be exhibited to show that things are not as simple as they seem. But this also suggests that there are other figures of speech in the Bible, right? So what are other figures of speech? And I, there's a reason why I want to labor these, these points. So what are, what are other figures of speech that we would encounter in reading the Bible? God's almighty arm. Well, what would be the that would be an example of one. What would we call that? What what would be the names of some of the figures of speeches? The examples are good too, but uh, to help us identify them more broadly. A parable, sure. A parable is a kind of uh, yeah. It's parables a type, sure. Metaphors. What's a metaphor? If I remember. <laughs> when, you, when you use one one thing to re- represent something else completely different. That's right. We're, it, there's an ordinary use of the word this way, but we're meaning it this way as a, in a representation. Yeah, what else? Anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism, what's that? It's uh, describing something in human terms, uh, giving human attributes to something to mm-hmm. describe it. Okay, good. What else? What other things might we encounter? Similes. Yeah, similes. Yeah. The one uses like or as and the other one That's right. You're generally finding two things that are uh, dissimilar and bringing a similarity through the use of like or as. Yeah. What other kinds of figures of speech might we encounter? What else is out there? How about hyperbole? What's what's hyperbole? 
exaggeration to make a point. I've told you guys a thousand times what hyperbole is. You should have it by now, right? <laughs> right? Yeah? Well, poetry is, a, I don't think it's considered a figure of speech, but in a way it's, it's, it's like a, another Sure. Yeah, it's a it's a genre, and it's helpful to uh, to understand that that particular style has within it uh, complexities that aren't present when you're getting a more didactic, clear teaching or a historical representation. So, yeah, recognizing you're in the middle of some poetry can can be very helpful. That's right. And there are other genres. The Bible, I think, has probably one of the first fables ever done in the book of Judges. Um, you've got allegories. You've got uh, types and anti-types. As you, things represent other things. They're not really quite in a, the same sense as um, metaphors are. But uh, mentonomies and synecdoches are both in there. Where you get comparisons and substitutions for things. So... The, the point of all this discussion isn't to help everybody, everybody be a, 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 a better literary analysis. I mean, that's, that's not the point, right? The point is that recognizing that the Bible is a complex document with lots of different styles in it. It has figures of speech that require you to stop and ponder what might be meant by this. Uh, no, uh, there's been a fair amount of uh, blood uh, and, and vitriol expressed over the years when Jesus says, this is my body. What does he mean by it? It's not altogether clear. Different people have different ideas. And if you're a literalist, if you're unable to see the types of um, ways words are being used, if you're unable to see how to put those things in place, you're going to miss some deeper meaning here. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the Bible is hard to understand in parts. And, and that's okay. It's a feature. It's not a bug. It's not designed to be different than that. It's got simple parts, but it doesn't. Let's look at one other section of Scripture, the book of Proverbs. And I only picked the book of Proverbs here, not because of its singular significance in redemption, or on, but that it's got a design intent that is expressed in the book itself to help dispel this myth that everything should be simple to understand. And what I'm proposing here is to make sure, you, make sure you're clear on it, that Solomon deliberately made the understanding of his words obscure. He deliberately did so. He wanted it to be something that took work. So let's read the first six verses here. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, uh, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. So we can see in verse 4, who is this book written to? Uh, it was for those who were simple. Well, who does that include? It includes a lot of people. If you don't understand the material, you're by definition simple, right? That's, that's the whole point is to, is to remove this condition from your life. To the young man, well, the young man hasn't had time to gain wisdom, has he? He hasn't acquired it by natural experience. But it's also to help the wise man, the one who has applied his life to learning, and a man of understanding. So, so this, covers, this covers everyone, everybody who's young and inexperienced, people who are wise and already possess understanding. And the whole point of the book is to know wisdom. That's what his stated goal is right up front here, to be acquainted with it. And you want to have a meaningful relationship with the truth. That's the goal Solomon has in, in writing this. But he mentions that, I, he says, I've got several different types of things to present to you. And the first is a proverb. I want to, I want to talk to you about proverbs. So a proverb is a compressed statement of wisdom that's been artfully crafted to be striking, thought-provoking, memorable, and practical. I like that definition. It's a compressed saying. It's, there's more in there than what is revealed at face value. So you can imagine Solomon taking a small vessel 
and he wants to throw a bunch of things in that vessel and pack it in to the fewest words possible using artistry, using a craft, so that he can make something that in the end, once it sticks, it tends to stick with you. But in order to get to it, it's going to require some effort. So then he has enigmas, satires, there's mocking in Proverbs, there's taunting in there, that uh, some things are done with a bit of a humorous uh, expense to the person being depicted in there. You can see what he does is, is silly. So he's got riddles uh, inside of Proverbs, uh, difficult questions. And how do, you, how do you unravel all of this business when you read the book of Proverbs? You can read it at a cursory glance and come up with uh, 10 ways to be successful, according to Solomon. That would be one way of doing it right. And all you would be doing is sort of memorizing trite things. But Solomon doesn't have that in mind. He has it as something that is, uh, he wants to take your time. Solomon wants you to expend your life thinking about it. So the truth God himself conveys to us through Solomon, the way God wants to talk to us is truth that requires to be pondered a long time before it can be understood or applied. This form of teaching defies an immediate and easy explanation. And so you can look at it and say, well, that'd be characteristic of Solomon. But remember, we believe this to be the inspired word of God. And what we're saying by implication here is that God wanted to prepare for us a series of things for us to think about that would defy, defy easy understanding. Something that would require you to spend a great deal of time. And what kind of time are we talking about? Your whole life. Your whole life to be given to the study of the scriptures and what they might mean. And so the, the idea of escaping the hassle, and I, I find there are a lot of things in our society that are measured by their hassle factor, right? I'm not going there. It's a hassle to get in the store. It's a hassle to do this. It's the parking lot's too big. The crowd's too big. This is such a hassle. I'm not going to do it. The Bible is a hassle by design. It's a lot of hassle. And you've got to sit down and wrestle with it. And you think, well, I didn't sign up for that. Well, sure you did. This is, this is God's way of filling your mind over the course of a, a lifetime so that you would understand who he is, what he has done, how he has saved you, and understanding his attributes. So you can't escape the hassle factor of the things in Scripture that are not plain in themselves. That's going to require a lifetime of work. So the, the point of this section here is to help disabuse your mind of the ease of understanding the Bible. That your life can be spent doing this, and even though it might not be what you want to spend your time doing, it is what God wants you to spend your time doing. He wants you to think about what he has said, and he wants you to do it until you understand it. Now, there are going to be lots of things you're not going to understand in the Bible easily. That's okay. We've got a remedy for that, too. So there's a remedy to get around this, right, to be helped with this. But it's not, it's not expected that we would eliminate the hassle factor of just thinking through things that are difficult to understand. Does that make sense? Is that something you guys buy into? Yeah? Do you think society is pretty anti-hassle right now? <laughs> Do you guys find that with people? Everything's a hassle. I, folks, I deal with everything's a hassle. I just can't do this. You can't expect me to do it. All right. Do you believe there are no shortcuts? No, yeah, I don't think there are any sh I haven't found any shortcuts. I've been thinking about this a long time. I haven't found any shortcuts. All right. Well, let's look at, uh, let's look at one other way we think about content. So the first was this unraveling the world, the word. We've got to apply ourselves to, to go through it. And... I want to talk this morning also about sermons as they relate to our understanding. And I think this is maybe an underappreciated uh, aspect of meditation. We want to meditate on the word. We want to meditate on what we've read and what we've studied. But I think we should probably spend a little more time thinking about meditating on sermons. So let me ask you the question. Why do we have sermons? Why do we have sermons? I mean, doesn't it seem a little odd? It's the means God has provided for us to be taught in church on Sunday. 
He has. That's exactly right. God has ordained, and we see this in the directory for worship, the preaching of the gospel, which is the power of God and the salvation, is central to the work of the ministry. And in section 22, the sermon is an exposition and application of scripture. So it has two ends in mind there. And in Westminster 90, how is the word to be read and heard that may become effectual to salvation? That the word may become effectual to salvation, we must attend thereunto with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Receive it with faith and love. Lay it up in our hearts and practice it with our lives. And all that's very helpful and is clear, and we do that, and everything's fine. But it doesn't answer the question, why do we have sermons? Now, what, what is, why, why did the model of hiring somebody to come up here on Sunday and talk to us about this for a half hour, an hour, become the power of God and the salvation? Doesn't that strike you as odd? It strikes me as odd. So I've got a way to make sure this salvation that I've accomplished on behalf of people gets applied to them. I got it. Let's get them together for a half hour on Sundays and I'll tell them about it. Doesn't that seem weird? Doesn't that seem a little odd that God would choose the means of preaching a sermon week in and week out? No. Well, I think it does, actually. I, I think out of all the things, there might have been something else, but it's clear he's done it. Right? It's clear that this is something that is, um, I don't know that you would have come up with this as the best way to save people for over the course of thousands of years around the world, but it's clear this is what he's doing, right? We've got it in the confession, we've got it in the directory, we practice this thing, and yet how much time do we spend thinking about sermons? Now, there's a difference. Bruce spends a lot of time thinking about sermons. Matthew spends a lot of time thinking about sermons. When I've had to preach, I've spent a lot of time thinking. And some people think he should spend more time thinking about a sermon, right? But how much time do you spend thinking about sermons? And what, what role does that play, the thinking about sermons and meditation? That's the key. The, the key here is not just a lesson on why do we have church organized the way it is? The purpose of this class is meditation. So I want to draw this into, we hear these sermons, but this is a class of meditation. So what's the link between the two? Thinking about what was preached to us. The problem with that, and I agree that would be a conclusion. The problem with that is that's not in my reading plan. That's not what I wanted to think about this week. I'm reading... I'm reading on Psalm 119 right now in my devotions. And we're reading on the Psalms in our family devotions. And now you're interjecting yet one more thing I need to be thinking about. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Man up, that's right. <laughs> That's what you asked. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So if you're thinking about what God has given us as the source material for um, our meditation, you can think of the sermon as a mechanism to provide that material in an alternate format that we should give a lot of weight to. We should think about it a lot. And you find in the Westminster 90 here, it says, we receive it with faith and love and lay it up in our hearts. What do you think lay it up in our hearts means? That's an interesting phrase, right? Here, here's a word. I'm going to send it out to you. I want you to lay it up in your heart. Meditate. To meditate on it. That's exactly right. That's why this question is in here. <laughs> Top of the class right there. All right. So uh, this idea of meditating, of, of applying our lives to thinking about what God's giving us isn't something that's done just in isolation in our own personal reading, right? So up till now, we've been discussing the reading plan and all the preparation, but here we're looking at something that's done in a more public exercise, something we're going to meditate on together. And I want to look at, uh, I want to look at a different passage today, uh, and I want to look at Luke 8 for a little bit. I'm going to read this section to you. And I want you to, I want you to think about this 
in light of meditating. So we're going to read a parable, and we're going to look at it a little differently. So this comes from Luke 8, in verses 4 through 15. This is the section on what's frequently called the parable of the sower. So you know there's a quiz coming. It's going to be related to meditating, so I'll give you a heads up. So listen for it. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they came to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on a rock, and as soon as it sprang up, withered away because it lacked moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up and yielded a crop of hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's a play on words right there in in Luke. Then his disciples, starting in verse 9, asked him, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, in hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience." All right, let's take a look at a couple of things. First of all, Jesus is speaking in a parable. Why, why did he use a parable? What was the point? Why did he choose that method, that style, to communicate some truth? He was just hiding it. It's a mercy for the people who aren't going to believe, right? It's not going to be held to their account to the, to the same degree as if it had been delivered more plainly. There's a, there's a mercy in that. And it's foretold by, I think he's quoting from Isaiah there. So it's, it's an artful form designed to conceal, but is it possible to understand the parable? Well, sure it is. You know, and the disciples, they didn't get it right up front. They heard the story and didn't have a lot of time and said, what does this mean? And Jesus says, to you, it has been given to understand. So there's a promise embedded in this that parables are not outside of what we're capable of understanding. It's okay. He can speak in parables, but if we put some thought into it, we'll get to it as well. There are four receptions given to the word. What are those four receptions? Wayside. Something falls on the wayside. That's right. What's, what are the other three? Ground, there's good ground. Yep, there's a rock, the rocky soil, stony soil, there are thorns, and there's good soil. What does this have to do with meditation? How might we think about this parable in light of meditation? Each of them might represent the level of meditation given to the word, like for the, the rocky um, waste side, it's a very shallow reception. Which would, which would tell us what about what that person did with the word? Not much of it. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, that's the point, sure. What else? The one that was uh, choked because of their, all their activities. And it was in God said the pleasures of this world. They're so busy doing stuff. They had no time to think about God's word. It reminds me of the way Paul describes the thoughts of the Gentiles, that all they see is the world before them and their thoughts are futile. You know, the sum of their mental existence doesn't add up to anything. Yep. Well, I'm gonna go, out on a limb. go on on a limb. I'm going to say that the parable is designed for meditation. That meditation God's word is designed already did create us, designed for meditation in a way that simply stating 
the gospel will be preached and some people will ignore it, some people will adhere to it for a little while. You know, try to, you know, so you can say it one compound sentence in a sense what the meaning of it is. But in fact, God's given us his word is not like a, a cliff notes outline or right. the Shams, the, you know, there's a different sort of, a, you know, short things that try to convey a lot of facts, right? Right. So, I, I would say actually the form of the prayer itself is, is designed to give us something to meditate on and not simply state all facts. That's exactly right. Uh, it, it, the, one of the underappreciated elements of these different styles is the art imposed in them. And it's like going to an art museum and looking at a picture. And you, you look at it, and if you're with me, you'll hear me say something like, well, there's a lot of pretty colors in there. And then Emily will look at it and say, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> right? There's a lot more in here than what meets the eye. Right? And the parable's the same way. It's the... the the object itself is designed for us to think long and hard on it and, and, and to be able to connect dots. Don't ever forget the connecting dots. You might look at it and say, that person let the cares of this world choke out the word in their life. Or, wow, I feel like my heart's getting cold. I wonder if I'm letting the cares of the world choke out uh, the word in my life. There's, so it can be applied to others, it can be applied to you, but you're exactly right, Jeff. The point is that it's something that we could be thinking about for a very long time. Very, very long time. Any other thoughts on the uh, parable we just read as it applies to meditation? I think it's also interesting that the thing that gets sown is the word, right? It's, it's not just good things in life, but it's, it's designed particularly to depict people who are approaching God's word in, uh, in different ways. So, all right, so the sermons are important. I hope you're convinced that sermons are God ordained and that sermons contain lots of things for us to meditate and apply on. I can assure you, your pastor and your elders would all like you to spend plenty of time thinking about sermons. Uh, but I, I, I want to uh, close with a few quotes. I've got about a half dozen of them. And I, I want to close with these because I think. Um, we live in an era today, especially post-COVID, where institutional trust is a little on the thin side. Uh, people like to think they know best, and on many things you do know best, uh, but not everything. Uh, there's a reason why we train pastors. It's a reason why we have institutions designed to uh, bring us the word. Um, and and it's true that not every expert is uh, is trustworthy on every topic. And, but the temptation to casually dismiss what others have said about this topic of sermons, I think, is clear to us. Um, but let's stop for just a moment and think, what if we had people who were saying the same thing and doing so for hundreds of years? What would they say, or what do they say, about the importance of sermons? So I, we've sort of laid out the fact that sermons are ordained by God, and that's clear, and our documents show this. And when you see the growth of the early church, you can see the singular role that sermons played in converting people and seeing people and instructing people. But I, I think the importance of thinking long and hard about sermons we hear is underappreciated today. And I was struck... Uh, as I, as I looked for what the Puritans had to say about the reception of sermons. So this isn't, this isn't about Bible reading. That's not it. It's not about reading books. And they, they helped encourage people to read, as Jeff was mentioning earlier, and literacy rates. They wrote lots of books. They expected people to read it. But here's a few different quotes on what they had to say about sermons that I hope will help us move the right direction here. Thomas Manton wrote, To hear and not to meditate is unfruitful. We may hear and hear, but it's like putting a thing into a bag with holes. He's a pastor, and he's observing, here's what I do for my people. I prepare something for them, and they throw it in their sack. Their sack is full of holes, and off it goes. Edmund Calamy wrote, the reason why all the sermons we hear do us no more good is for want of divine meditation. 
After a lifetime of preaching, he's saying we could get a lot more out of life, folks, if we just meditate on the word. Richard Baxter, a terrifically successful pastor in, in, bringing in his preaching ministry and bringing the town to Christ, he writes, and why so much preaching lost among us and professors can run from sermon to sermon and are never wary of hearing or reading and yet have such languishing, starved souls. I know no truer or greater cause than their ignorance and unconscionable neglect of meditation. You see, it's not the hearing, the lack of hearing, that's the problem. It's not the lack of reading that's the problem. These people are willing to ingest everything, but they're not going to digest anything. And Baxter describes it as a languishing of soul. James Usher, and this is the last one, James Usher writes, Thus to meditate one hour spent thus is more worth than a thousand sermons. And this is no basing of the, no debasing of the word, but an honor to it. Thus the word is particularly applied and laid home. So he's making a, a careful distinction that the meditating on the sermons that, that we hear is very important, and it's not dishonoring God's word. As if we're kind of segmenting, we can read and we can study and we can meditate, but he's saying to meditate on the sermon is not to go back and say, I don't need the word. What he's saying is this is an accompaniment to the word. It does it honor because it's been taught and then applied to us. Sermons are important. Maybe a little more important than we'd like to believe they are. And adding the meditation of the sermon into your life will help prevent the languishing of the soul that the Puritan spoke of here. So that's we're going to call it quits there today. Uh, before we get on to the next section of thinking about the word, but I'd like to get your thoughts on the idea of the sermon as a particular object of meditation for us. Well, you, you kind of alluded to this in a negative way earlier, which was that the, you might have chosen to read Psalm 119 for your devotions and Proverbs for family worship, and here the pastor comes along and has something totally different but in a way, that's a feature. That's exactly <laughs> right. It's getting new stuff that I would not have picked out to read uh, necessarily. I mean, not that I wouldn't read First Peter, but, <laughs> but I, you know, it's not what I was reading in devotions. Right. Bruce comes along and gives us all kinds of uh, important things that, to reflect on. You know, warring against the lust of the flesh. Uh, that's one I remember. And, uh, you know, the recent one on the uh, being in God's will and suffering and how we're blessed in suffering, right? It's two things I've thought a lot about that maybe I wouldn't have gone off and read those or maybe if I had, I wouldn't have just read it, maybe I wouldn't have meditated the same way because Bruce filled it out differently and it, you know, brought different points to mind. So, that's a feature. That's, that's excellent. That's very helpful. That's exactly right. You are not, this may come as a surprise, you are not the best judge of what you need to hear. <laughs> You are not exclusively the best judge, right? Yeah, thank God for that. It kind of gives us pastors, people to preach and teach. Amen. What else? It doesn't have to be either or. Like, oh, I'm just going to be meditating and reading what the sermon was about. You can just add that to your plan. That's exactly right. Yeah. In. Incorporate the meditating of the sermon on the plan. That's right. And that, and that meditation may include listening to it again. Right, listening to it again, or going back and listening to another sermon. This is what I need in my life right now, but it's it's a it's a form of the word coming to you in a different way. And it's all God's word. It's all one book. It's all together. It's not like I'm writing a paper on you in peace while reading Doctor Who. Which I did during. <laughs> That may be the first time in the history of SRPC that someone mentioned War and Peace and Doctor Who in a coherent sentence. <laughs> I know exactly. It's right. No, you're, you're exactly right. Yeah, There are new things to be learned in Sunday School of SRPC. 
Yeah, you're right. That's right. It's okay, Dave. I'm still waiting for Bruce to bring up Charles Williams again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, just like Solomon's ships, <laughs> sometimes they're apes and peacocks, and <laughs> sometimes there's gold and silver. <laughs> Dave, I was also going to point out that, uh, you know, as a session, one of the things we decided to do was to have a sermon discussion on Sunday afternoons, and that's actually aimed at helping you to meditate on, you know, think about what you heard. Yeah, the sermon discussion is is so important. Uh, you're going to hear things that other people picked up that maybe you didn't see. Uh, you're going to understand something maybe a little fuller, or you can maybe see how somebody's applying it in a in a way or a struggle in their life that's helpful. Uh, sermon discussions, they're important, absolutely. And it's also an additional way to help keep the Sabbath. Uh, it, it has multiple uh, goals and goals to it, so absolutely. Bruce? I'll add to that that the prayer guide on Wednesdays has a portion of praying through the sermon so that there's a just a, uh, a reduplication of the sermon points but I try to, to, to lead you to think about how to pray all of the truths that are, are there so just another another tool, another aspect of bringing the sermon back in midweek in your life that's an excellent reminder that's an excellent reminder Yep. what are the thoughts about sermons in meditation come to mind I think of uh, Amos and there being a famine for the word of the Lord we can all thank God we do not have a famine for the word of the Lord we uh, we are pleasantly um, fed in our souls that we do not have that famine and not every place in the world has that so there's Good things to be had by thinking about the benefits of the richness of God's word being delivered through a variety of ways. So, cool. All right, any other comments before we close?